What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about cerebral palsy. Before we get started in this video, guys, if you guys enjoyed this video, you benefit from it, please continue to support us by subscribing, hitting that like button, and commenting down in the comment section. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into it. All right, Ninja Nerds, so before we start off on the etiology and go through each individual kind of substage here of cerebral palsy, the first thing I want you guys to know is, how do we define cerebral palsy? Because it's really important, it is a neurodevelopmental disorder, okay, so it's an upper motor neuron type of lesion, uh, and we'll talk about what that looks like, but it's important to remember that it's non-progressive in nature, so it generally does not get worse, the disease itself, like the actual damage doesn't get worse, the problems don't generally progress throughout time. And so that's important, now there's many different causes that are associated with cerebral palsy. Um, sometimes we, we kind of say it's multifactorial, so it's not just kind of like one pinpoint cause that you can really say. But a lot of them we can trace back to um, prenatal development or um, during the birthing process or maybe immediately postnatal after birth. So what are some of those causes? The first one that I really want you to remember that is the most common cause really associated with it that we see is premature births. So this is, uh, there are kind of two primary reasons why um, that, and, and it's still kind of being figured out, but again, this is one of the things that you guys really need to remember is this is the most common cause. So premature births, obviously the brain isn't completely developing. It's not having the adequate amount of time it needs to develop. And what happens is, it usually the most common of these things that lead from, happens from the premature births is a condition called periventricular leukomalacia. We're gonna abbreviate that, periventricular, P-V-L, periventricular leukomalacia. What happens in this condition is that there's an inadequate blood supply to the kind of inadequate developed brain. And so some of the tissue around the ventricles starts to die. And it's that white matter, those white matter tracks that are the descending tracks from those upper motor neurons that are getting afflicted and damaged. So that's why we call it periventricular leukomalacia. So this is gonna be one of them. The other one is an isolated intraventricular hemorrhage. So sometimes small capillaries near the ventricles are a little bit fragile, and because of that, they can rupture. Blood can go into those ventricles and maybe even cause a little bit of a hydrocephalus as well. So these are two of the things that are commonly seen are associated with premature births, and these types of insults are what lead to the actual damage, the upper motor neuron lesion that is gonna be what you see with cerebral palsy. The other one is usually intrauterine infections. So infections that arise during the, the actual prenatal period. Um, and these are sometimes referred to these intrauterine infections. We actually like to help ourselves remember all of these different causes. And we do this via a mnemonic, right? We use the mnemonic TORCH. So what does TORCH stand for? The first is T-toxoplasmosis. So the first one that I want you guys to remember is the toxoplasmosis gondii. These can cause some insults to the actual brain leading to these upper motor neuron lesions. That's the first one, toxoplasmosis gondii. Oh, we're gonna save that one for last because that's other, and that's really anything that you can think of <laughs> afterwards. R is rubella. C is cytomegalovirus and H is herpes simplex viruses. Now, O is other, and really this applies to a bunch of different things. Syphilis is pretty high up there, the new one, Zika, and sometimes even the varicella zoster virus are other ones as well. But again, what's happening with these is that there is some type of insult on the brain that's leading to this upper motor neuron type of lesion presentation. Um, and again, this could be uh, this upper motor neuron lesion that you see, particularly in the spastic cerebral palsies, okay? But again, this is gonna lead to some type of, we can either say upper motor neuron lesion, or if we want it to be really, really generalized, we could say brain injury. I think that would actually be kind of a little bit more general, since there's many different areas that are injured with cerebral palsy. So let's fix that and put brain injury to be a little bit more general. And we'll go into the pathophys and explain all of that stuff a little bit later. Another big thing that we wanna remember as a potential etiology is whenever there's not enough blood flow, like oxygen particularly, that's getting to the fetal brain. And so sometimes this could be like what we call hypoxic or ischemic insults on that fetal brain. And there's a bunch of different causes that could you know, really precipitate this. And one of the big ones that you really don't wanna forget um, especially for your exams here, 
um, is going to be any type of placental issue. So obviously the placenta is responsible for supplying oxygen to the fetus. So whenever there's like a placental abruption, there's placenta previa, um, anything like that really can lead to a, an inadequate oxygen delivery to the fetus. And so that's an important one to remember as a potential etiology here is that there's some type of placental um, insufficiency present. Okay? The other thing that you really want to remember here is sometimes it's not actually like the process before birth, it's actually during the birthing process. So during the birthing process, sometimes maybe like, or maybe it's even during uh, prenatal, maybe that cord actually kind of gets compressed. So if there's some type of umbilical cord compression, uh, and maybe that's either during the birthing process or it's prenatally, and that's compressing the actual blood flow to the fetus as well. So sometimes there may be even some type of uh, umbilical cord compression, but if it's like prolonged, because this can happen sometimes, but if it's like a chronic or prolonged type of situation, you're really uh, de depriving the, the fetus of oxygen. So these could be some cert uh, certain situations that could arise. And again, you could even say like a complicated labor process. Um, so complications that arise from labor. Okay, so these are the big ones that we kind of get to during that kind of prenatal period, and I guess you could even say uh, during the antenatal period, uh, the, the, during this actual perinatal period, okay? The next one here is after birth. So what are some things that can arise after birth? And this is really like uh, hemorrhage is a big one. Sometimes this can happen actually right during the birthing process, there could be trauma that causes an intracerebral hemorrhage, or it actually could be um, some type of traumatic event postnatally. So one of the big things here is that after, like during this postnatal time frame, is that you can see issues primarily with um, intracerebral hemorrhage. And again, this is usually secondary to some type of trauma. So we're representing that with that kind of blood here in the brain. The next one that I want you guys to remember here is that if sometimes if there is an infection of the actual meninges or the brain tissue itself within the fetus, so sometimes if there's some type of meningitis or encephalitis, right, respectively, these could also be responsible uh, for causing some type of insult to the fetal brain, right, whether if there's hemorrhage or if there's like an infection of the brain tissue. So th these are things that are imp important to remember. Other things that can happen here is not just an in intracerebral hemorrhage, but sometimes the babies can develop an acute ischemic stroke as well. So that's something also to, to, to think about um, that can happen either during the actual uh, the developmental process or postnatally. The next one that's really interesting, and I like to throw it in there just because it's 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 very uh, kind of an interesting one is uh, kernicterus. So kernicterus is actually whenever there is a very high level of bilirubin, particularly like the unconjugated bilirubin. Um, that builds up. So we'll here, we'll put increase in the billy. And what happens is, usually red blood cells, they can undergo lysis. And when they lyse, what happens is they spill a particular molecule out here called bilirubin, right, from the heme. And it's really indirect or unconjugated bilirubin. And what it's supposed to do is go to the liver, get conjugated, and get put out into the bile. But if you have a lot of hemolysis that is occurring of the baby's red blood cells, for whatever reason, that bilirubin can accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. It won't get conjugated. And what happens is whenever there's a lot of this, it loves to cross that blood brain barrier and cause damage to a lot of different structures within the brain tissue. And particularly your, your basal ganglia, but we'll get to that later. And what happens with this is that this can produce that actual brain injury or lesion, okay? So kernicterus is another one to remember. And usually it's secondary to some type of hemolytic event. The last one that I want you guys to remember, and it's, you know, it's, again, we're not completely sure, but there may be some type of underlying genetic involvement. Um, genetics, particularly what we see, um, is that this could be some type of autosomal recessive disorder. Um, particularly one of the, the genes that they have been somewhat associated with it is the glutamate decarboxylase one enzyme. So some type of mutation or deficiency in this enzyme, the mechanism of how it does this is not completely understood, it may be related to the neurotransmitters, particularly glutamate and GABA, but there's some type of mutation or deficiency associated with this particular enzyme. 
So these are the particular etiologies that I really, really want you guys to take home and remember about cerebral palsy. Again, premature births being the most common, intrauterine infections, some type of a hypoxic or ischemic insult, a traumatic event that can lead to an ICH, infection of the brain tissue, kernicterus or genetic susceptibility. All right, so what I want us to do now is, since we've kind of covered the etiology of cerebral palsy, is I want us to undergo kind of the classification and associated pathophys of cerebral palsy. So cerebral palsy has different kind of like types, if you will. Um, the first one here is your spastic CP, right? Spastic cerebral palsy. So that's your first one. And we'll go through um, particularly the different pathophysiological associations with that. The next one here is going to be what's called a dis kinetic CP. And then the third and final one is going to be an ataxic CP. Now I do want to make sure that we're very clear that there is actually one other type, but it consists of these three and it's a mixed. So you can have an associated mixed cerebral palsy, which may involve some spastic and dyskinetic or maybe a little bit of all of them. It, it really depends. By far the most common out of these three classifications is going to be your spastic cerebral palsy. Now, pathophysiology-wise, now that we've covered the classification, spastic cerebral palsy is usually some type of lesion of these upper motor neurons within the cortex, right? Whether it be kind of these cell bodies or maybe some of those white matter tracts from that periventricular leukomalacia, right? Because that's one of the big causes there. So primarily, it's an upper motor neuron lesion. So here's what I want you guys to remember. It's important to remember this. We talked about that in our, our, our lesion video um, in our neuro playlist. What are the classical signs that you see with spastic types of, or particularly, I should be uh, more, phrase it correctly, upper motor neuron lesions? What are those classic things that you see? Let's, let's write those down over here. So, the big things that you see with upper motor neuron lesions that we will see in all of these here is what? The first thing you'll see here is increased deep tendon reflexes, hyperreflexia. The second thing you may also see is an associated clonus. The third thing that you'll see is increase in tone, particularly spasticity, okay? Thus the name spastic cerebral palsy. And four, you may even see some associated weakness, but that weakness actually within this condition is more likely associated with that tone, okay? So it's important to remember primarily that whenever someone has an upper motor neuron lesion, which is in spastic cerebral palsy, these are kind of your classical findings. One other one that I actually wanna add in there is the fifth one, but we can actually associate it with the deep tendon reflexes is that they can also have positive pathological reflexes. And you guys remember one of the big ones, the Babinskis, okay? And upgoing Babinskis. So we understand that these are the classical features of an upper motor neuron lesion, and that's what you're gonna see in spastic cerebral palsy. But here's the thing that we actually have to be a little bit more particular about. There's subtypes of spastic cerebral palsy. What are those subtypes? The first one is actually called hemiplegic. Okay, so we call this one hemiplegic cerebral palsy, or the, the spastic subtype. The next one is called diplegic, and the last one is called quadriplegic. And you can obviously make out from these names what's the problem. Let's explain it with this underlying kind of like where is the lesion, if you will. So let's say that this person developed kind of an, an insult to the brain what, from whatever the etiology was and it damaged these upper motor neurons, particularly, in this case, the left cerebral cortex over here. What happens is you guys know that these, these descending tracks will come down and then at the level of the medulla, the pyramids, they'll kind of cross and then come down to the opposite side over here. And they'll go down to these lower motor neurons in your spinal cord, which will go out to the muscles on the contralateral side. If I have a lesion, particularly involving these neurons here or here, What's gonna happen? I'm not gonna be able to stimulate my lower motor neuron to cause these muscles particularly to work properly, right, on that contralateral side. 
And so what happens is, there, we're not gonna get into the cr crazy detail here. If you guys wanna know more about it, go watch our neuro video where we talk about uh, upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron lesions. But what's gonna happen is you're gonna have this weakness, this spasticity, these hyperreflexic types of things that you're gonna see on the contralateral side. And what happens is, since it involves pretty much this entire motor homunculus, you guys remember your homunculus? homunculus? This is gonna be your foot, this will be like the trunk, this will be like the head, the arms. So because of that, it's going to affect the entire side, but on that contralateral side. So they'll have some type of uh, problem with that right arm, maybe even that right leg, okay? And so we kind of have our little stick man figure here showing you some of these problems with spasticity, uh, particularly maybe even some weakness, hyperreflexia, and abnormal postures present on that right side due to a, a lesion on that left side. That makes this next stuff relatively easy then, diplegic particularly the upper motor neurons that are more towards like the medial surface, right? Because again, where, what's gonna be here? This is the legs, right? And then as you go a little bit more laterally, you hit more of like the arms and trunk and stuff like that. But this one, diplegic, is primarily going to involve lowers more than your uppers. You may get a teensy bit of the upper involvement, but it is primarily lower extremity involvement. So now follow these down. This will come down to the medulla, they'll cross, and they'll go down to your lower motor neurons here that'll go out to your skeletal muscles and cause them to function properly, right? If there is a lesion involving this portion here and this portion here, these will not be stimulated properly. And what will happen, the muscles that are being supplied on both of these sides will become what? Have hyperreflexia, there could be some clonus, some spasticity, and maybe some associated weakness, particularly where? In the lower extremities, okay? The last one here is your quadriplegic, and this one's relatively obvious. You're hitting both extre upper extremities and lower extremities bilaterally. So that means you're taking out the entire motor homunculus on the left side and the entire motor homunculus on the right side. And you're gonna be knocking out arms on both sides, legs on both sides. So if we were to kind of track all of these down really quickly here, same kind of concept here. These are gonna come down, down to the pyramids, they're gonna cross, go here to the lower motor neurons and the upper extremities. They'll even continue down here if we really wanted to. To the lower extremities, and then go out here. If you hit this entire motor homunculus on this side, entire motor homunculus on this side, you're gonna start developing these neuro deficits that are present bilaterally in the upper and lower extremities, okay? Because you're hitting the motor homunculi entirely. So that's how what we would see in these spastic cerebral palsy. So again, if I said to you guys hemiplegic, it would be one side, okay? But the entire motor homunculus. Diplegic, both sides, but particularly, you're gonna get medial for the lower extremities. And if I said quadriplegic, bilaterally, the entire motor homunculus strip. Okay, and then don't forget the classical signs that you see with spastic CP. Hyperreflexia, clonus, pathological reflexes, and spasticity. Now, dyskinetic CP. This injury is primarily of the basal ganglia. You guys know you got tons of these basal ganglia structures. We're not gonna label them, but I want you guys to remember you got your lentiform nucleus with the globus pilatus and the putamen, and you got your caudate, a bunch of other structures. But in these situations, what do I really need you guys to remember? The basic like physiology of these structures. It's really simple. They initiate movement, but more importantly, what else do they do? They prevent unwanted motor movement, or just we'll put unwanted movement. Guess which kind of thing happens primarily in this type of a situation? In someone who has dyskinetic CP, it, it primarily over accentuates this type of activity here. Okay, so primarily they develop this uh, lesion which inhibits their ability to prevent unwanted motor movements. So instead of them being able to prevent unwanted motor movements, a lot of them actually happen. And so because of that, what does this actually look like? So they actually don't prevent anymore from this situation here. What happens is they develop unwanted motor, motor movements, a lot of them. And these are classically seen with chorea, and we kind of have it representing down here with our stick guy, right? It's constant, like, un jerky, um, kind of a rhythmic movement that's not the same every time. 
They can also have maybe some associated athetosis. You usually see this with chorea, where they have these arrhythmic, uh, these rhythmic movements that are not the same, along with kind of a snake writhing-like movement of the hands. And then the last thing is that's terrible here is they develop this intense type of rigidity because basal ganglia plays a big role in your actual uh, tone, like the, the agonist and antagonistic muscles being able to work kind of in conjunction with one another. If you damage that, you lose that ability. And so they develop this intense rigidity, these kind of sustained involuntary muscle contractions. Maybe they're kind of like held like this, maybe they're like this, maybe they have blepharospasms, but that's called dystonia. And see, these are the classical features that you see with this dyskinetic CP. All right, so the next one here is ataxic cerebral palsy. So dyskinetic, we said there was basal ganglia, spastic was kind of cortical. In this case, ataxic is you're injuring the cerebellum. You know, your cerebellum is super important, carries out a lot of different functions. Um, so the big ones that I really want you guys to remember is tone, right? That's a huge one. Um, it also plays a role with kind of like your balance and your coordination, right? So balance, coordination. And we can even put in their posture as well. And so because of that, whenever there is an injury to the cerebellum, you're losing your tone, right? And so because of that, one of the problems here is that they develop hypotonia, right? So very, very floppy kind of muscles. They lose their balance and their coordination aspect. And so what happens is sometimes they develop this kind of like wide-based gait, right? So they develop this sense of ataxia and they develop a wide base gait and they're constantly kind of stumbling over. And the other thing here that you wanna remember is that it plays a role kind of in your, your, your coordinated of, coordination of movements, right? So the, the ability of you to maybe take your finger to your nose and touch it to someone else's finger or slap your hand back and forth rhythmically. And so because of that, they develop in, uh, abnormalities in that. And so because of that, they can develop kind of like these uh, things like what's called dysdiatokinesis and sometimes even another one called dys Dysmetria. Uh, dysdiatokinesis is an alteration in the rapid alternating movements, and dysmetria is an alternate, uh, all abnormality whenever they're doing their finger to nose test. So these are things that you want to really kind of pick up with ataxic cerebral palsy, okay? So uh, this kind of gives you the basic classification and underlying pathophysiology of cerebral palsy. The next thing I want to talk about is the complications. All right, so now let's talk about the complications of cerebral palsy. So one of the big things is obviously it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. So if the brain doesn't develop adequately, there's going to be some type of maybe cognitive or intellectual disability associated with that. So one of the big things to remember here is that there can be some type of cognitive um, dysfunction or intellectual disability that may arise from this. The next thing is it's also affecting, again, certain cortical neurons, and because of that, um, you may even have some type of seizure activity that could develop from these. So seizures is another common complication. Um, I'd say that these are kind of one of the two most common complications um, associated with um, cerebral palsy. The next one is because it does affect, again, uh, different nerves and muscles, sometimes it can affect the muscles that are around the eye. And so sometimes it can pull in certain directions and create maybe strabismus, it can create maybe some amblyopia or visual refractive error. So they can also develop visual um, problems or abnormalities as well. Okay, so we'll put vision problems. The next one here is it can affect also some of the uh, structures within the inner ear and it may lead to hearing difficulties, so hearing impairment. And here's where I would say that you also face the next common issues. So these are the next ones that are really important. The next thing is because, again, those muscles are so spastic, they can create this what's called neuromuscular scoliosis, where they pull certain tendons or bones and stuff like that kind of out of alignment. And this can create very intense type of abnormality within the spinal curvature, uh, what we call scoliosis. Also, Again, because it's pulling on bones because of that intense spasticity, especially very, very commonly is adductor tone. They have an intense amount of adductor tone. That's why they have that scissoring gait abnormality sometimes. What happens is it pulls on these femur and near that joint, it can pull medially and kind of sublux or cause a hip dislocation as well. So sometimes you may see some hip uh, dislocation or subluxation associated with it. The next thing is with respect to kind of like a couple different things actually. One of them is speech difficulties, and this can be due to a variety of reasons, but dysarthria is relatively common complication that you can see associated with uh, cerebral palsy. The next one is 
And again, we'll explain why in a second. The next one is dysphagia. So dysphagia is another really common one that you can also see. And also, let's kind of, okay, let's take some time to quickly, quickly explain this. So sometimes people in who have cerebral palsy can have what's called a pseudobulbar palsy. So a pseudobulbar palsy. And so basically what happens with a pseudobulbar palsy is you have neurons, upper motor neurons within your cerebral cortex, they'll come down and innervate different nuclei within your medulla that go and supply particularly the muscles that are involved in speech and muscles that are involved in swallowing. Well, if these neurons, upper motor neurons, are damaged, it's going to alter the signal to those neurons in the medulla. And so those aren't going to go and stimulate the muscles that are involved in speech and that are involved in swallowing as well. And so they can develop this dysarthria and they can develop this dysphagia that's present. One of the other complications that are associated with this is because they have difficulty swallowing, a lot of their secretions will kind of pool up in their oral cavity because they have a hard time being able to get those secretions and swallow them properly. And so the other big complication is they can have what's called sialorrhea, which is an intense large amount of uh, salivary accumulation and secretions. So these are kind of the big kind of things that you may see associated with cerebral palsy as well. The other thing is it affects the actual tone, particularly of the GI tract. They may have a little bit of decreased tone to the GI tract as well. And so they can develop things like gastroparesis and also constipation is a relatively common one as well. The next one is also a very, very scary one because this is sometimes one of the things that are associated with a little bit more of the higher mortality from uh, cerebral palsy is because they have this problem with dysphagia and being able to control their secretions. Sometimes they can aspirate a lot of their secretions. And so because of that, this can increase their risk of what's called aspiration pneumonia. The other one that's actually very interesting here is because they have this scoliosis, because of those spastic muscles, it can kind of pull maybe some of the bones or structures that are involved in breathing, your thoracic cage or the rib cage, and they can create kind of an abnormal deformity within it that makes it difficult to take in a proper amount of air. And so sometimes they can develop hypoventilation syndromes. Okay, where they're not able to get in as much air as they want. And so it kind of can present somewhat similar to a, um, a restrictive lung disease, if you will. The last one, and probably one of the ones that is the most intense here, is their spasticity. That spasticity is a very significant thing here, especially in spastic cerebral palsy. And that spasticity does a couple things. One is it can cause a lot of pain. Okay, a lot of pain. The other thing is over time, it can lead to weakness and atrophy if that muscle is not being utilized properly. And the next thing here um, with this associated spasticity is not just kind of the pain, not just the weakness, but also it can create joint contractures. And that's also a prob problematic thing too, so joint contractures. So it's important to remember that whenever we have someone with cerebral palsy, we're not just dealing with one thing, we're dealing with a plethora of complications. So it's a multidisciplinary type of treatment that we have to talk about. So one of the big things here is when we talk about cerebral palsy and we say treatment, it's not one thing, right? There's no true cure for cerebral palsy. We can just try to treat all of the associated complications. So it's a multidisciplinary approach that I told you. It's not just one thing. Um, so from the medicine side standpoint, you know, one of the big things that we would be doing as uh, nurse practitioners or PAs or doctors is that you would be dealing with kind of the medical management or surgical management. But there's a lot of multidisciplinary areas that are involved. For example, if we want to help their mobility, we're going to need to send them to PT. If we want to help them with their intellect or cognitive dysfunction, we may have to spend, send them to an uh, occupational therapist, have proper educational support systems, send them to speech therapy for the dysarthria, um, give them proper nutritional consults for dysphagia, and, and maybe pro, a gastroenterologist for their constipation or gastroparesis. So you get the point. There's a lot of different modalities that are involved in this condition. What I wanted to take a little bit of time to do though is talk about some of the medical management that we can utilize for patients with cerebral palsy. Primarily, the most important one is spasticity and then secondarily, some of the surgical interventions that we can try if the medical management isn't working. But again, the hallmark treatments is these multiple multidisciplinary approaches, PT, speech therapy, OT, and a lot of other uh, systems that are being involved or modalities. So first thing, spasticity. It's a big problem. 
and it can cause a lot of pain, it can cause a lot of like, weakness and contracture, so we wanna to try to reduce that. And so what ways can we do that? We can give what's called antispasmodics. Now, I don't wanna go crazy into detail here, I wanna give you guys the, the, what you need. And this important thing here to really get across here is that there's a couple drugs that can act centrally, and there's really like a couple drugs that can act peripherally. So the central drugs that I really want you guys to remember, the really, really important one, is baclofen. So baclofen is gonna be a very, very important one. It acts centrally. So these are your central medications, okay? Baclofen is one. The second one is diazepam, okay, which is a benzodiazepine. The third one is tizanidine, which is a um, kind of a muscle relaxant, if you will. So these are the three big central ones that I really, really want you guys to remember. The peripheral ones, on the other hand, there's really two primary ones that I want you guys to take away from this. The first one is called Botox injections. So the botulinum toxin, botulinum toxin injections. And the last one here is called dantrolene. So again, we're gonna very, very quickly go through the mechanism of action. I don't wanna get too crazy on these, but I want you guys to get the bare things that you guys need to remember for this. So the only way that we can do that is, let's say that here we have that inhibitory neuron, right? Why is it inhibitory? That's kind of the big thing here. This is an inhibitory neuron within the spinal cord because it releases a neurotransmitter called GABA, okay? And then this one is your upper motor neuron, right? And your upper motor neuron tries to kind of act on these lower motor neurons to stimulate them, so it releases something called glutamate. It can also release something called norepinephrine too, but this is the primarily of the stimulatory one. So when we give drugs like baclofen, baclofen primarily works to act on GABA receptors. And so whenever this inhibitory neuron is releasing GABA, it, baclofen just helps to amplify that GABA neurons. And so these neurons will then do what? If you have, this GABA is going to inhibit, it's going to cause these neurons to fire less. If there's less firing of these lower motor neurons, these muscles won't be contracting as much. And so because of that, that reduces that spasticity acting as a muscle relaxant. Diazepam does the same thing. It tries to enhance the GABA action on these lower motor neurons. So these ones have pretty much the same kind of action. Tizanidine, it works to actually inhibit glutamate release. So if you inhibit the stimulatory uh, neurons, then you're not gonna have these neurons firing as much. And so the whole basic concept is baclofen, diazepam, increase the inhibitory action on the lower motor neurons, and tizanidine is going to inhibit the stimulatory effect on these lower motor neurons. If they're less stimulated, they don't fire as much, they don't stimulate the muscle to contract as much, the muscle relaxes, okay? The peripheral action is the botulinum toxin, right, and dantrolene. So what happens is here the lower motor neuron, you particularly have vesicles that contain acetylcholine, and whenever this nerve is having action potentials, it releases acetylcholine that acts on receptors that stimulate the muscle to contract, right? When you give someone Botox, particularly, you know what that's doing? The Botox injections are actually inhibiting the fusion of these vesicles to the membrane, inhibiting acetylcholine release, inhibiting the skeletal muscle from having stimulus to contract. The muscle doesn't contract, the muscle then starts to relax. And the last one is dantrolene. You know, whenever a muscle is particularly contracting, it has these things called sarcoplasmic reticulum that spit out calcium because calcium is needed in order for those cross bridges to be activated. Guess what dantrolene does? It inhibits this calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You don't have calcium to cause those mus muscles to contract the muscle then relaxes. So these are the basic concept of how these kind of antispasmodic works um, and how they work and what they are. Now, the last thing I wanna mention here is one of the things that you try as you go through these medications, one of the most common ones is baclofen. What happens is, is if you've tried all of these oral medications, you haven't seen much benefit, or the injection, the Botox injection, and you haven't seen benefit, what they will do sometimes is what's called intrathecal baclofen. They'll take a pump and they'll actually have a baclofen go directly into the spinal column and deliver that medication. So that's kind of the antispasmodic effect. Now, anticholinergics are important particularly for those dyskinetic CPs where they get that intense dystonia or rigidity and also a lot of salivary secretion sometimes. And so anticholinergics, what are their jobs? I just really want you to take away what would they be utilized for.
their primary effect is going to be for dystonia, for that rigidity, right? And sometimes they even help with tremors as well. And then the other one is they're going to help with that sialuria, okay, that increased salivary secretions. All right, there's actually only one of those there, two R's. So sialuria, dystonia, and tremors. So how does this work? I don't want us to get too crazy, but I want you to know that these medications are primarily affecting the cholinergic neurons in your basal ganglia and dyskinetic CP. So how do, the basic mechanism is how do these really, these anticholinergics work? You're using a ton, there's a couple different drugs. Benztropine, eh, it's, it's somewhat effective. One of them that has been seen effective in dystonic treatments is, is what's called trihexyphenidyl. So trihexyphenidyl. And there's a lot of other medications for dystonia. This is just one that's usually a little bit more effective and it has a couple different actions um, or overall indications. So the basic concept is that how this drug works is there's muscarinic receptors on certain types of neurons present within this uh, basal ganglia. And whenever you have this dystonia, there's an alteration in dopamine levels and acetylcholine levels. What trihexyphenidyl will do is it'll block the effect of acetylcholine on these muscarinic receptors. And so what it'll help to do is to try to re-sustain that balance between acetylcholine and dopamine, bringing them back into a normal range to establish this decrease in dystonia or rigidity, a decrease in tremors, and decreased salivary secretions because these uh, trihexyphenidyl and other drugs, uh, glycopyrrolate, other medications as well, can also act on muscarinic receptors in the salivary glands. And that's why sometimes they have kind of a double action there. So these are anticholinergics, good for dystonia, rigidity, tremors, and sialuria. The last thing here that I want you guys to remember for cerebral palsy is the surgical and somewhat non-surgical interventions, uh, just not like particularly this medical management. So one of the things here that you guys want to remember is that sometimes because of these abnormal postures that they develop, sometimes they need particular types of bracing devices or sometimes they even do casting um, to really kind of prevent these contractures from developing. So sometimes they'll do bracing, like braces uh, and casting to help to prevent these excessive contractures or changing of the shape um, of the overall limb. The other thing is in patients who have this intense adductor tone, and, and toe walking, kind of that high plantar flexion tone as well. What happens is sometimes they can do particular types of soft tissue surgeries to go in uh, and really kind of relieve the muscles, the tendons, and some of the other structures around that area to relax the muscles a little bit. So sometimes they'll do like soft tissue surgeries um, to release those muscles a little bit. Okay. The next one is actually one of the ones that really was interesting um, and becoming a little bit more commonly utilized here is what's called a dorsal rhizotomy. So what they actually do is they go in and they kind of cut, selective dorsal rhizotomy, they cut some of those sensory nerves that are coming into the spinal cord because you guys know that spasticity has two components. You have a sensory component and then a motor component. Well, if we kind of cut some of that sensory component out of it, we're going to alter that spasticity loop. And so they can do what's called a selective dorsal rhizotomy to cut some of those <clears throat> sensory fibers and prevent that intense tone. So sometimes you may even see this as an option, what's called a dorsal rhizotomy. And there has been some you know, pretty decent benefit to this actual mechanism. The last one is that, again, going back to the scoliosis, the hip dislocation, stuff like that, sometimes because of having to maintain um, this neutral spine, they may need particular types of surgeries or interventions to keep that spine in line. Maybe they need rods. Maybe they need particular types of pelvic osteotomies and certain types of procedures to maintain stabilization of that hip joint as well as the vertebral column as well. Again, not forgetting that multidisciplinary approach of multiple uh, modalities being involved. All right, engineers, in this video, we talk about cerebral palsy. I hope it made sense, and I hope that you guys did enjoy it. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.